Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Those of you who know me well know that I am something of a perfectionist. I know. One of the values that my father helped instill in me is captured in the wisdom saying, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. Good enough was not part of my father's working vocabulary. He was very conscientious about doing everything he did well. That was true in the work that he did as a telephone installer for Bell of Pennsylvania. It was true in the renovation that he did on our home when we moved into an unfinished two-story Cape Cod house when I was a young boy. It was true in the way that, that he went about his artwork that he did for recreation, painting tech signs and crafting stained glass and throwing pieces in clay. Good enough. This wasn't good enough for him. Dad wasn't an obsessive, compulsive personality that needed to have everything perfect. But he was very conscientious. He wanted things done well. I've inherited that value from my father, and for the most part, it's, it's had a very positive influence on my life. It's taught me to pay attention to detail, to follow things through to completion, to take my time and be thorough and thoughtful and careful. Today I get a tremendous sense of satisfaction out of knowing that I've done something well. But I have to say this value of doing things well has caused me to struggle a bit with our text for this morning, particularly around Paul's concept of sufficiency. My grace is sufficient for you. Sufficient seems like a pretty low standard. Now, Paul doesn't strike me as a good enough kind of guy. That's why he wrote so many letters back and forth to all of the churches that he started. Most of our New Testament collection consists of letters that Paul wrote to give instruction or correction or advice or warnings about potential pitfalls to avoid. Paul wasn't content to let whatever happens happen. He wanted things to go well in the churches that he helped initiate. He wanted to make sure that they stayed on the right track. He wanted to defend them from outside influences that threatened to corrupt their faith or distort their convictions. Every time he got word of a conflict or a dispute or a problem in one of the faith communities that he helped organize, Paul wrote letters or sent messengers or even went back in person until things got straightened out. The passage that Emily Joy read for us this morning from his second letter to the Corinthians is a great example. Today's text comes at at the end of a very long litany of Paul reviewing his credentials and reminding his readers why they should pay attention to him instead of some flashy new super apostles who had come into their community and had begun contradicting some of the lessons that Paul had first shared with them. For most of the 11th and 12th chapters, 
of his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul defends his authority as a legitimate apostle who has shared in the sufferings of Jesus, who is deeply devoted to the gospel that Jesus proclaimed, and who has experienced a depth of spiritual encounter unsurpassed by any other mortal. But as we heard in the passage that we read this morning, after all of his boasting, Paul concludes that none of it means anything because it isn't really about him. It's about God. It isn't Paul's faithfulness that matters. It's God's faithfulness that matters. But then, in, instead of going on to boast about God's faithfulness, Paul uses diminutive language to talk about God. My grace is sufficient for you, says the Lord, for my power is perfected in weakness. Really? I mean, that's it? Sufficient? God's grace is sufficient? What about amazing? We just heard this beautiful anthem about amazing grace. Sufficient grace? It doesn't sound very impressive. Sufficient sounds like good enough. Good enough. It's, it's adequate. Mediocre. It'll get by. It doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Sufficient seems a little old-fashioned in a culture that values superlatives. We like things to be awesome. Amazing, fantastic, outstanding. Sufficient seems a little frumpy. It isn't sexy or glamorous or breathtaking. It doesn't stand out or demand attention. We don't really notice things that are sufficient. We tend to take them for granted. When rainfall is sufficient, we never read about it in the headlines. We had sufficient rain today. We hear about excessive rainfall that causes devastating flooding like they're having right now in South Carolina. That's all over the headlines. Or when we have insufficient rainfall and severe drought is afflicting people like, like it is right now in Southern California. No one notices sufficient. We don't think about having sufficient strength to get up out of our chairs and walk across the room. We never think about having sufficient mental capacity to comprehend language and follow coherent thoughts. We don't think of having sufficient financial resources to keep a roof over our heads and food on our table. Sufficiency is not something we aspire to. It's the minimum requirement that needs to be satisfied just to get by. When Jim and Lucy and Tom and I were planning worship for this morning, we had trouble finding hymns to sing. We don't sing about the sufficiency of God. We sing in superlatives. Our God is an awesome God. God's grace is amazing. God's love is all-excelling in the culture Obsessed with superlatives, we expect God to show up in spectacular ways, in miraculous interventions that leave the best medical minds in the world baffled by the results, and in catas 
cataclysmic clashes that threaten to unravel the very fabric of the universe as the convergence of the blood moon and the super moon usher in the final days of the apocalypse. We made it through Wednesday, that's good. But instead of spectacular, Paul points us to the sufficiency of God operating quietly in the background, unnoticed, overlooked. And by doing so, by reminding us of the sufficiency of God's grace, Paul strips away the illusion of our own self-sufficiency. He reminds us that power is perfected not in strength, but in weakness. Not in our own autonomy, but in our recognition of how utterly and completely dependent on the sufficiency of God's mercy and grace we really are. Jesus once said to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches, those who abide in me and I in them will bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. So, what if we really believed? What if we really believed that God's grace is actually sufficient. That nothing else is necessary. What if we didn't have to prove our own worth day after day or justify our existence or defend our legitimacy for just being here? What if we really believe that no matter what sins we've committed in the past, no matter what failures and shortfalls we have in our resumes, no matter what litany of disappointments and disillusionments we claim for ourselves, God's grace is sufficient. It was the sufficiency of God's grace that enabled the Apostle Paul to persevere and remain steadfast in his work spreading the gospel throughout the Gentile community around the Mediterranean, even though he rarely, if ever, saw signs of fruition. Even though he was constantly besieged with complaints and quarrels and questions and challenges to his authority, Paul was strengthened in his ministry by his ability to trust that my grace is sufficient. If I truly believed the promise that my grace is sufficient, I probably wouldn't be so obsessed with checking on how many likes I get on my Facebook page when I post my last sermon. I probably wouldn't worry as much as I do about the sustainability of the institutional church in the 21st century. I probably wouldn't feel so anxious when I don't have clarity about where I need to focus next in my ministry. Sufficiency is the antidote to anxiety. In those moments when we feel overwhelmed, when there isn't enough air in the room to breathe, when the walls start closing in, when our heart starts racing and our senses go into high alert, sufficiency is the antidote to anxiety. Sufficiency reminds us that we already have 
everything we need. But all we have to do is breathe. By focusing on inhaling and exhaling is enough. Because of the sufficiency of God's grace, the list of what we absolutely need to be accomplishing in this very moment is incredibly short. Just breathe. Just breathe. That's sufficient. Trusting in the sufficiency of God's grace not only calms our anxiety, it also gives us the courage to risk great things in faith. Because power is perfected in weakness, we don't have to worry about having everything under control all of the time. We can risk taking on a six and a half million dollar renovation project to transform our church into a facility suitable for ministry in the 21st century instead of just fixing a boiler. We can risk embracing the radical hospitality of Jesus by becoming an open and affirming congregation, and then embodying that identity more fully by calling a queer pastor to help us reach people who have never, ever found a church that could be their spiritual home. We can risk calling a third pastor to help launch Koinonia to reach the millennial and Gen X generations, even without having the money to sustain it in our operating budget. We can risk examining white privilege as a way of moving into the work of racial equity and remaining steadfast in that work even when it means losing beloved members of our faith community. In a culture that embraces superlatives, we know that we are at our best when we hold fast to our belief that God's grace is sufficient. That God's power is perfected in our weakness. As we continue our movement through this season of discernment, We know that the faith we embrace isn't sexy or glamorous or breathtaking. It operates quietly, almost imperceptibly in the background, relieving our anxiety, reminding us that we already have everything we need and giving us the courage to risk great things in faith. Amen.